If you'd open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, I want to preach a message to you that I'm calling, Wash Your Hands. It says in Mark chapter 9, and this, by the way, just to set the scene before I jump in, this happens just after a miracle the Bible calls the transfiguration. Uh, if you are familiar with the story of Scripture, you know the Bible says that Jesus took three of his 12 disciples and led them up a high mountain where he was transfigured before them, which is to say that he gave them a small peak of the glory that he will have throughout all eternity. When we encounter Jesus, he won't be <laughs> gentle me- Jesus, meek and mild. When he returns, there's a glory to him. He's a, there's a shining to him, a power to him. And so he gave them on the mountain just a, a small peak of the miracle of heaven, of the power of heaven. And for the occasion, he even pulled a Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and brought Moses and Elijah, Old Testament saints who were no longer on the earth, Moses because he died, Elijah because one day God sent a fiery chariot to pick him up. OK? And these two came back to ha- hang out with Jesus on the mountain and to talk about the cross, because the cross was coming. And they were talking with Jesus, sort of just speaking about what was about to happen, the death that he was going to, to die on our behalf. And uh, Peter, James, and, and John got to witness this. And then <coughs> Jesus and his disciples began to head down the mountain. Now, Peter would have had them stay there. In fact, while they were talking, Peter interrupted Jesus speaking to Moses and Elijah and said, man, this is great. We should stay here forever, which is always the temptation when God does something powerful in your life to want to keep it to yourself. We should just stay here forever. But the the point was not to remain on the mountain, but to go back down the mountain and die for the sins of the world so that all of us could experience the power of heaven. Come on. This is too good to keep to ourselves. The work that God has done in our life, we got to share with the world. We want more people to know. And so God the Father interrupted Peter and said, hey, uh, Peter, could you please be quiet and listen to Jesus? And uh, he's got something to say. And then they went back down the mountain. And as they were coming down, the Bible says an, an enormous crowd rushed up to Peter and James and John and, of course, Jesus. And that's where we are in verse 17 of Mark chapter 9. It says, then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and the water to destroy him. Can you imagine this scene, this child doing this to himself, harming himself? But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And Father, we pray that you would speak something special, precious, and important to our hearts as we quiet ourselves for a moment to listen to you. Entering into a new year is nothing to take lightly, because your word says you crown the year with goodness, and your paths, they drip with abundance. And so we want all you have for us in this new year. We want to see Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. 
before we jump into the talk, if you could just shake someone's hand near you. Just come on, just right, right hand, left hand, doesn't really matter. And now the, your, your second choice, for whatever reason, shake their hand as well. Very good, very good, very good. Everyone's got a hand shaken. Excellent. You know, they say globally, four out of five people don't wash their hands when they leave the bathroom. <laughs> I'm sure the people you just shook hands with do. I'm just saying, on the earth, out of all the human beings on this planet, four out of five, when they use the toilet, they, they, don't, wash, they don't wash their hands, which is devastating. And as a result, many people die of unnecessary, preventable diseases, many kids especially. 6.6 uh, .6 million children will not reach their fifth birthday this year. Uh, the two primary killers are diarrhea and pneumonia, both of which can be prevented, both of which can be, can be treated in, in many instances. They actually say that if, 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 if people around the world just wash their hands more, just coming out of the bathroom, just washed your hands as a, as a rule, then worldwide, diarrhea deaths would be cut down by as many as a half, and that respiratory diseases would be cut by a third. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the problem isn't that they don't have so. Most homes in the world have a bar of soap in them. As high as 90%, even in developing countries, have access to soap. I mean, it's been around since 2800 BC when the Babylonians discovered it. So soap is normal, and soap is widely available and relatively inexpensive. In many homes, though, throughout the world, soap is reserved for special occasions. It's viewed as this sort of like, you know, commodity, this sort of like luxury that's, you know, there for washing clothes and washing dishes. And yeah, when you take a bath every once in a while, whenever that happens, yes, you use soap. But it's, it's not viewed as something you need to use all the time, every, every day. So here we have people dying, like this, like this child here who's throwing himself in the fire, this, this child who's, who's in, in grave danger. People dying, not because they don't have access to soap, but because they don't take advantage of the soap. The problem isn't availability. It's awareness and action. Interestingly enough, here's these disciples who are unable to cast this demon out, unable to help this child, which, by the way, they have successfully done before. These disciples, Jesus had sent out on ministry assignments. And they had come back literally and said, the demons listen to us. We do ministry in your name, Jesus, and it works. And Jesus said, just remember, you shouldn't brag about the fact that you've done great things for me. Just be stoked that you know me. Right. Just rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice that you have a name on a table setting in heaven. That is to say, stay humble. Stay small in your own eyes. Don't get too big for your britches. Don't start feeling your oats and talking with an accent. Oh, yeah, look what we did. You don't have an accent. What are you doing? Right? Don't start wearing sunglasses at night. Right? Just, just, be, just, just be grateful to be saved. Stay humble. And if you stay humble, there's no telling where you'll go. Someone said that there is no end to what God can do with the man or woman who's willing to give him the credit. And so here's the disciples able to command demons when they were humble, when they were small in their own eyes and dependent. So obviously, here, What's happened is they have gone out in their own strength. They went to try and do this in their own strength. Now you're like, well, hold on. Why did, why did Jesus take the good disciples with him? Of course, these other nine, you know, Bartholomew, what has he ever done? He took Peter, James, and John with him on the mountain. He, he left the JV team down below. Of course, they couldn't do it. No, I think it's, you have it exactly backwards. I think the reason he always took Peter, James, and John with him is because they needed supervision. I think these were the most responsible of the whole team here at the bottom. And they couldn't do it. The ones who were able to be left without a babysitter, they couldn't do it because they had gotten their eyes off of Jesus, which is why he tells them, you weren't praying and fasting. Now, of course, he doesn't literally mean, like, encounter the demon. OK, stop eating. Everyone at lunch, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. We can't take this demon out. No, the point is, these are the two things that foster the kind of spirit of humility that is needed for us to be able to do the things that God has called us to do, a dependence on God, which we foster through prayer, a dependence on God, which we foster when we set aside a time and say, we're going to fast 
so we could have a time devoted to seeking the Lord, to make that space to seek him. So the disciples couldn't help this child, not because they didn't have access to what they needed, but because they didn't take advantage of it. Maybe like, like us, they made the mistake of treating prayer like people in the third world use soap for special occasions, for dire situations. We betray our viewing prayer this way when we say things like, you know, uh, we just have done everything we can do. Now it's in God's hands. All we can do is pray now. Hey, newsflash. Prayer shouldn't be a last resort. It should be your first line of defense. Prayer should be the first thing we do. We should call on God before anything else. Someone said you can do more after you pray, but you can't do anything until you've prayed, truly. And so we should view as, like I said, a first line of defense, this idea of praying and fasting to keep, to keep seeking God paramount. Because the problem in this situation wasn't the things the disciples tried to do. No, no doubt they tried to do many things for this child. They tried to do many things. The reason they were powerless wasn't because of what they did do, but it was because of what they didn't do. And maybe you feel stuck. Do you ever feel like in your walk with God, you're not taking ground like you should? You're going, what's the problem? I, maybe I read my Bible or this or that. Maybe, maybe the problem isn't what you're doing. But the problem is what you're not doing. Take some time to pray and to fast, to cultivate humility and hunger for God, to watch him move in your life in that way. I jotted down three things that will happen if you give yourself over to to praying and fasting. Number one, it will slow you down. It will slow you down. Literally, physically, it will slow you down a little bit. When you're you're feeling uh, anxious, when you're feeling just sluggish spiritually, I wonder if you don't notice that oftentimes you're hurried. You're rushing. Enemy, the enemy of the spiritual life is, is rushing around, her, hurrying to and fro. So when we pray, we, we intentionally slow down a little bit. And there's something beautifully inefficient about prayer. I mean, think about it. So to get on your knees and, and to pray, you know what you're not doing? Anything else, namely all the things you need to do that day. I can't pray. I'm very busy. Someone said that on those days, you're too busy not to pray, because you need that strength to to go about the rest of your day. So it's inefficient. But I found that when I take that time and and set aside uh, a space to seek God, there's more of me and a better version of me to face all the things on my list than if I just were to rush into the day. I watched this TED talk about how uh, supposedly worldwide, this is crazy. This number is just, is just outrageous. 13 billion pounds of paper towels get thrown away every single year in this country. 13 billion pounds of these. It's a lot. And this, the answer this TED Talk was saying is for us all to just cut back. Because if you're like me, you, 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 you sit there and <laughs> right? And you get all these out there, and then you're just like, and so, sometimes it's so irritating when like, it only spits out like four inches. And you're like, what am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to do with that? I don't like the little crank thing either. I don't want to touch anything in a bathroom. I don't want to like, get in there with my elbow. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. And, uh, and, and so um, when we designed these bathrooms, we made sure there was no doors. I don't know if you noticed, you don't touch anything going in. You don't touch anything going out. It's very beautiful. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so he was like, but you know, when you think about if he said, if we all just use one of these a year, I mean, think of millions of pounds less going into, into the landfill every year. And uh, he says, the, the secret, this is crazy, the secret to using one paper towel is, uh, is to, to, to fold and to shake. To fold, so you have to fold it, and then you have to shake. All right, so when you have wet hands, you, what you have to do is you, fold, you already folded it. You already did that. You have to do that ahead of time. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. So your hands are wet now, right? You have to shake 12 times. He said there's something secret about the number 12. In the video, he says 12 is the number of apostles. 12 is the number of tribes. 12 is the number of the zodiac. And 12 is the largest number with only one syllable. All right, so now we've shaken our hands out 12 times. And now, with a folded paper towel, you can perfectly dry your hands only using one. Hey, and check this out. 
If you take the time to slow, you, that's, that, that's, not, that's not fast. <laughs> Sit there and think, I mean, you're never going to forget that. The rest of your life, you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Baby steps. Baby <laughs> steps to the trash can, right? Baby steps. You, but that's inefficient, time-wise. But there's less waste because of it. I'm telling you if, you, if you take the time to slow down long enough to pray, if you take the time to begin a year by seeking God through fasting, you will see a better version of you because of that inefficient use of your time. Don't you notice that it's so easy just to tear through life at, at warp speed, multitasking all the time? CNN on, and a thing over here, and oh, yeah, I got to watch that on Netflix. And uh, just always something to do. And we're all kind of feeling that like smoldering fear of missing out, right? Because I'm here, but is there something better going on? Did I not get invited? Are they having fun without me? And as a result, we're, we, we can sometimes not be present anywhere. Ravi Zacharias, in uh, his book, The Logic of God, he talks about how there was a day when he was in Russia at a museum. His wife wanted to see some paintings, and he tolerated it, went to the museum with her. And she was looking at all the paintings. And he was like, come on, honey, let's go. Come on, kind of at her elbow the whole time. Like, let's get through this. We got to get out of here. Got to speak. Got to go to the airport. And so he, he didn't really get anything out of the experience. And later on, a couple years went by, he was reading a book by Henry Nouwen. And in the book, Henry Nouwen talks about how he sought out a time in his life to go to St. Petersburg, Russia, and go to that exact museum. Because he had seen uh, a duplication of a painting by Rembrandt on the prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son, and he wanted to see the real thing. And so he got on a plane, flew all the way to Russia just to see this painting, and went to the exact museum that Ravi had blazed through and found the painting. And when he found it, he sat down on a bench and stared at it for four hours. And in the book, Ravi, I mean, it's too long. But the book Ravi was reading, he was, he, he was, Henry was saying, that day changed my life. While looking at that painting, God so spoke to me clearly about what I was to do with my life and how I was to transition out of one career go into another career. So life was never the same from Henry, for Henry because of what God did while looking at that painting. And Ravi says, reading that book, he felt like such an idiot because he had looked at that exact same painting and got nothing out of it because he saw it in a hurry. And then in the book, Ravi concludes it by quoting A.W. Tozer from Tozer's devotional Mornings with God, where he says, and I quote, I have often wished that there was some way to bring modern Christians into a deeper spiritual life painlessly by short, easy lessons. But such wishes are in vain. No shortcuts exist. May not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit of skipping through the corridors of the kingdom like little children through the marketplace, chattering about everything but pausing to learn the true value of nothing. God has not bowed to our nervous haste nor embraced the methods of our machine age. It is well that we accept the hard truth now. The man, don't, listen, don't miss this, the man who would know God must give time to him. Or as another theologian put it, if you end your training now, if you choose the quick and easy path as Vader did, you will become an agent of evil. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> now we've, we've gone from Yoda to, to Tozer. And in it all, what we're discovering is that you, we all need to be slowed down a little bit, to not rush into our day, to not rush into another year without pausing. That's what this fast is. It's to disrupt our schedule. It's to disrupt, disrupt the, the regularly scheduled broadcasting that is your life. Because you're going to blink, and it's going to be gone. You're going to blink, and you're going to be at the end. So this is a chance to say, hold on a second. I want to I smell the flowers that God has put in this world. I know it's all covered in snow or mud at the moment. But I want to smell the flowers come spring. I want to I wanna, I wanna seek God. I want to I wanna slow down a little bit, because God uh, wants to spend time with us. And the person who wants to, to, to know God must spend time with God. <laughs> Second thing that prayer and fasting will do is tap you in. They'll slow you down and tap you in. And when I say tap you in, I mean tap you into new energy, tap you into new power. I think all of us at times feel run down, feel tired. Coming to the end of one year, you're beginning another. Sometimes it's possible to think, 
I don't know how I can do this again. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I feel that a lot. You know, it's been um, well, next year we'll celebrate 14 years. I hope you'll come out next week as we celebrate our birthday. And I'll continue the series, preaching on fasting some more and prayer some more. And we'll just really see this journey unfold in this not quickly broken series so that God can make us anti-fragile, strong on the inside. But there's sometimes fatigue that sets in. I remember. Uh, you know, just one year ending, another year beginning, I was driving to church uh, for the evening service uh, the, the weekend we gave the, the 2020 offering. And as amazing and as a, much of a high mountaintop it was, I remember feeling tired thinking about writing a 2020 year and giving sermon. And I just, I don't know why that popped in my head. Like, hey, you're going to have to write that uh, or another sermon like that in a whole other year. And I literally was like, <sighs> just tired. It's, it, life is like that. It's monotonous. And then sometimes I have to do this. My reward for this mountain is another mountain in the distance. <laughs> awesome. And yet, the Bible says, when we are run down, when we are weak, guess what? He is not. He is strong. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get weary. So what's so beautiful is that when I get down on my knees, and I stop striving and stop working, and I, I, I just stop for a minute. He's like, hey, guess what? I didn't stop working. Hey, guess what? I didn't stop. I'm not tired. And, and I want you on your knees so I can put my strength inside of you. God will give you new strength. He'll tap you. Don't you need it? Don't you feel your need for a God who can mount you up with wings like eagles so you can run and not grow weary and walk and not faint? Come on. God doesn't just want you to be slowed down. He wants to slow you down so he can tap you in, so he can mainline his Holy Spirit into your heart. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Come on, life is draining and taxing. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you have the power of the Holy Spirit on you, I mean, you could stare down a giant. You can run over a valley. You can. You can, you can leap over a wall when you sense the Holy Spirit of God upon you. You just think, there's nothing I can't do, because I have the God who created the world in me. When I feel tired, when I feel worried, it's because I'm not praying. I've never been singing to him and, and, and exalting the resurrection of Jesus Christ and at the same time felt run down. There's just, it's just impossible to do that. You sense the Holy Spirit. So it'll slow you down. It'll tap you into his energy inside you. And then thirdly, it'll clean you out. It'll clean you out. There is truly a sense in which the water of the word, when you meet with God in scripture, when you pray to him, the spirit will just cleanse you. There's a cleansing that happens. We, we live in a dirty world. Now, Jesus has cleansed our heart. And this all fulfills the Old Testament. Because when the priest would, would, would represent God, you would go to a priest. We go to Jesus now. We'll talk about how that became possible. But first, you went to a priest. And the priest couldn't just show up to work without first washing their hands. There was a ceremony they went through, a way of saying, like, sinful man can't just stand before God. There has to be a washing. There has to be a sacrifice. But it got perverted. It got distorted. And by the time Jesus showed up, I won't read it to you, but re read on your own time Mark chapter 7, just two chapters to the left from where we sit in Mark 9. Mark 7, there's this amazingly funny story where the disciples of, uh, of the Pharisees and scribes, they come to Jesus and go, hey, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And you're like, well, they're onto something. They shouldn't do that. That is gross and unsanitary. It wasn't like an issue of germs. It was an issue of, of not going through the rituals that the Pharisees had added on to the tradition. They had made it all about them. They had made it all about what they would do for God. And so they had this huge thing they would go through. They would wash their hands like all showy in public, like I'm too sexy for my shirt and stuff. And they would even like wash their couches all icky weird. And so the Bible says in Mark 7, they came to Jesus having found fault. Sidebar, if you look for faults, you'll always find them. I say in this new year, let's stop looking for faults. Let's look for the good. Let's look for the best in people. You will find whatever you look for. And if you're looking for a reason to get offended, if you're looking for a reason to get hurt, if you look for those things, you'll find them. So they were looking for fault. They found fault with Jesus. He was healing people. Could they have looked for that? He was preaching God's word. Could they have looked for that? But no, they found fault. And Jesus, Jesus said, my disciples are not going to do your traditions. And Isaiah the prophet put it this way. He said, my people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
What the Pharisees didn't understand was the whole culture of washing hands was never meant to be a showy religious thing that was happening on the outside. It was about a supernatural reality that God wanted to do on the inside. It wasn't as much about washed hands as washed hearts. And through you seeking God in prayer and seeking God in scripture, that's what the weekly gatherings are about. That's what the small groups are about. Ever since Jesus rose from the dead, his people have given themselves over as they've grown to large group meetings on the weekend of worship and small group meetings for life change and discipleship. When we meet in small settings and homes and Bible studies and coffee shops, as, as we do life with one another, that's where we grow. We go, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? How's life going? A dinner, sitting at a table, that's a place for transformation. This corporate worship on a weekend is powerful. But if it's not followed up by a small, intimate, relational approach to sanctification and growing, it will never be what it could be if you would give yourself over to it. Because it'll clean you out. It'll just, just, just wash you. How does it work? Well, James 4, 8 puts it this way. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your, your hearts, you double-minded. I like how the message translation puts that when it says, say a quiet yes to God, and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. I love that, because it's easy to kind of like, on Sunday, worship God, and then Friday this way. And it's like, put your right foot in, put your left foot out. I will love God a little bit and shake it all about, right? <laughs> and, and what he's saying is, no, come on, seek God with your heart. Draw near to God. Make that space for God. He'll clean your hands. He'll clean your heart. He'll change the way you think. He'll change what you value. He'll start making you love what he loves and hate what he hates. There's just a cleansing that happens. It starts to purify your heart. And you rise up. Uh, without regret. I've never in my life regretted praying, Not except for when I prayed for patience, <laughs> right? <laughs> but joking. Um, but because God will answer that one. But when we think back on 2019, I'm sure we all have regrets. But none of us are, are going, I regretted reading scripture. I regret telling my friend about Jesus. Those things we're, we're grateful for. But the beautiful thing is the more we seek God, the less we do in between that we have reason to have heartache about. And that brings us to James Garfield, our 20th president. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for, for James Garfield. <laughs> I read a book about him by Candace Millard this past year. And I didn't know anything about James Garfield, so I wanted to know everything about him. And you know, he, uh, he didn't want to be president. He was the last president to, to be raised in a log cabin, very poor. Didn't have shoes uh, for a while. And when he finally went to college, his family just realized he was very smart. You need to go to college. You, need to, you, you, you have a great gift. You need, to, you need to use it. So they made it possible for him to go to school. He nearly drowned at one point and realized maybe God has a plan for my life because he, he should have drowned by all, 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 all rights. And um, in school, he put himself through paying for tuition by, by working morning and evenings as a janitor at the college. But something happened when he started studying. He realized he was given a very powerful mind. He said, a slumbering thunder awakened in his soul when he began studying. Yeah, make that guy president. A slumbering thunder was awakened in his soul. I hope you live long enough to discover what awakens a slumbering thunder. What is it that God put you on this earth for? Maybe it's not a political office. Maybe it's designing a building in CAD. Or maybe it's, it's treating uh, a, a sick puppy in a vet veterinary clinic. I mean, I'm just telling you, God has put us all on the earth for something. And when you do the thing that God's called you to do, come on, there's a slumbering thunder ready to be awakened in your soul. And he excelled. And everybody around him said, you're a natural born leader. And uh, he was a reluctant president because he was a dark horse candidate and never wanted the office for himself, never actually put his name in the ring. Someone else nominated him. He was there at the convention to, to give a speech on behalf of someone else. And, and someone said, who, 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 what do we want? And someone goes, James Garfield. And he's like, no, quiet, shut up. That's, I'm not running. And they said, yes, you are. And he, eventually, he's president. Here he is in the Oval Office. Didn't want it, didn't ask for it but was willing to, to serve, willing to do it. And, and so he begins to serve, and he hates it. He hates being president. 
He hates everything about the way it's all sort of set up. And uh, he wrote in his journals, I, my god, is there anything about this job that would make anybody seek it out? It was the end of the spoil system era. And so anybody could come and petition for why they should make their case for why they should get this post or this assignment, be postmaster, or ambassador to France, or, or whatever it was. And so there was open hours at the White House. Anybody in the country could just barge into the White House and demand to, to make their case for the president. And he, he did not like that. He said, these people would take my flesh, my brains, my blood if they were able to. They just want to just take, 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 take. Now, sadly, we never really got to see what he, what he had within him as a leader, because he was only president for six short months. And two of those months, he spent dying in a bed in the White House. And that's because one day, when he was heading to the train station to board a train to go spend a little bit of time with his wife, who was re recovering from malaria at their home out of the White House, uh, a man named Charles Gateau walked up and shot him in the back twice. And there's drawings of what that day looked like. Now you're like, where is the Secret Service? Incredibly, even though this is 20 years after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president, the 20th president, James Garfield, had no Secret Service with him at all. The country figured the assassination of Lincoln was a fluke and more to do with the Civil War. And they didn't want a king who had bodyguards. And so they didn't protect their, their president. They didn't protect their leader at all. So this deranged madman, who was very much the mirror opposite of Garfield, he wanted to be great. Gateau wanted to be wonderful, wanted to be known worldwide. Actually, the last thing he did before shooting the president in the back was going to a shoe shine and having his shoes shined, because he figured the world was going to celebrate what he had done, and he wanted to have shiny shoes on the occasion. So he was able to just walk up, shoot the president in the back, who was just there with two of his sons and some members of his, his cabinet, including Robert Todd Lincoln who was Abraham Lincoln's son, who, of course, had been there as a small boy when his father was shot in the head. He now here is, is witness to uh, President James Garfield being shot in the back. And 20, this is incredible. 20 years from now, uh, from the death of, of Garfield, he will be present the day William McKinley is assassinated as well. If you are president and you see uh, Todd Lincoln anywhere around, I would just say, no. <laughs> you, you, no, no, you, you, you go, 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 go. You're not welcome. This guy witnessed three out of four assassinations, everybody but JFK. So Todd Lincoln, Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, rushes off to fetch a doctor. Garfield's been shot in the back twice, goes to fetch a doctor. Who does he get? He gets Dr. Dr. Bliss. Now, I didn't stutter. His first name was Dr. 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 Bliss, the same doctor who had tried unsuccessfully to save Abraham Lincoln. And he comes, and he's very excited because he was kind of a celebrity seeker. So he loved the idea, the shot at redemption this offered to him, to save a president. That was what he was going to do. So he begins to commandeer the scene, everyone out. I'm, I'm, I'm on charge here. And for the next two months, he, like a, bull, like a pit bull or a bulldog, guards the room. Very jealous of who's allowed to treat the president, who's allowed to come in, who's allowed to, to be there, and, and, and guards the scene, and for two months unsuccessfully tries to save the president's life. He figured that one of the bullets was lodged next to the liver, and so his number one goal was to get the bullet out. If I'm going to save the president's life, got to get the bullet out. And so as daily newspaper bulletins were telling what was going on, the president's progress, he lost 80 pounds, uh, very weakened. Um, he, he, we got to get the bullet out. Someone reading all this uh, named Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone, said, so, so, well, I want to help however I can. So he goes ahead, since he's Alexander Graham Bell, he invents the metal detector, which is a great accomplishment, really, if you think about it. And he calls the White House. He's a phone, because he's Alexander Graham Bell. He calls the White House <laughs> and says, I invented a, the machine that I think could help us find the bullet. So they bring him in. And uh, Dr. Bliss says, the bullet's on the right side by the liver. And that's the only part of, of the president's body he lets him search with the metal detector. Well, he's searching, scanning. There's no bullet there. There's no bullet there. And none of it's successful, but there's a lot of interference. Turns out they find out later it's because he was on a bed with metal springs, which is not great for a metal detector to work on. 
But Alexander Graham Bell is just horrified. He feels like a, a complete failure, no bullet. Well, Bliss was wrong. The bullet wasn't on the right side. It was on the left side. But he wouldn't let Bell search that side. But it didn't really matter, because the bullet was doing no harm. They would find out later during the autopsy that this was a distinctly, here's the words of the autopsy report, survivable gunshot wound. Both bullets had avoided all vital organs and the spine and had lodged themselves in pockets of tissue and were doing no harm. And the entry wound, of course, was cauterized by the bullet as it went in. So Garfield would have likely survived this had they just left him alone. But Dr. Bliss did not leave him alone. Starting on the floor of the train station, he inserted an unwashed finger into the wound to try and fish out the bullet from within moments of Garfield being shot. And he repeatedly did so for the two months between the shooting and September of 81, when Garfield finally died, not of a gunshot wound, of infection and blood poisoning because of what Dr. Bliss had repeatedly introduced into the body because of his unwashed hands. Now, the worst part of it is the fact that it was completely and totally unnecessary. Because a man named Joseph Lister, Dr. Joseph Lister, and you hear Lister, you're like, like Listerine? Yep, Listerine, named after him, 16 years before the shooting, had postulated a theory about germs being responsible for infection as opposed to bad air, which is what they believed. Bliss believed air, bad air, was what caused infection. And you know what they thought brought bad air in? Changing bandages and washing wounds. We can't do any of the things that bring cleanliness into the environment, because that will bring bad air in. So Bliss's creed was, li was listen to me, the dirtier, the better. He refused to let Garfield's bed sheets get changed. He never changed his scrubs. He never washed his hands, because you wouldn't want to introduce any bad air. But Lister was saying, 16 years, saying, I think there's germs. If we just clean our instruments, just use clean bandages, and just wash our hands, our patients will do better. By this point, most of European doctors were listening to Lister's advice, and people were doing well. And when Lister began preaching this in the United States, most doctors ridiculed him as being completely a quack, though not all. Some listened. In fact, the company Johnson & Johnson was started after listening to what Lister had to say when speaking at the 100-year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia at the Big Fair Expo. He spoke about it. And Johnson & Johnson started as a way to make clean surgical instruments and bandages. And they've done pretty well for themselves. But Bliss was like, ah, that's ridiculous. Let's keep dirty. The dirtier, the dirtier, the better. So he reveled in the filth. When Guiteau was finally hanged for the assassination, his last words were, well, among them, I may have shot the president, but it was his doctors who killed him. And he actually isn't far from the truth because of a lack of washing of hands. And as I was reading this and preparing to, to speak, I, God just impressed upon my heart the last day of Jesus Christ before he died. That was what Moses and Elijah were talking with him about on the Mount of Transfiguration, the death that he was about to die. But the Bible says, on Jesus's last day, a washing of hands was involved. Matthew 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw, he's the governor, that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and, say it aloud with me, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Listen to me carefully. Garfield died because his doctor didn't wash his hands. The day Jesus died, it was after Pilate washing his hands. But the reason God sent Jesus to die was so that he could wash our hands. Not through our religious achievements, not through us keeping the law or perfect church attendance, not through how many prayer times you'll have in this next three weeks, not through anything Titus 3.5 says that our works of righteousness, which we have done, 
How is salvation? How is the washing of hearts? How is the washing of hands? According to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that the message of the gospel isn't try, it's trust. It's not do, it's done. What should be our response to that? What should be our response to a God so good he would wash our hands for us without us doing anything? He stood there as a sheep before his shears is silent as Pilate washed, tried to wash the blood off of his hands, not realizing that you can't get out of making a decision about Jesus. Every one of us makes, must make a decision. But what should our response be? Our response should be what Romans 12.1 says. It should be in light of the mercies of God. We should surrender ourselves to him afresh as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. It, it means it only makes sense that we would stand up and give our lives to God every day, wanting to seek him, wanting to know him. If he loved us so much that he died for us, what should we do? We should give our lives to him. Is anybody with me at all? Come on, hop up on your feet. Father, we're here for you. We want to seek you. We want to know you. We want to dedicate and surrender our lives to you. As we're praying, if you're resonating with this, if you would say, yes, that's me. I want to dedicate my life afresh to God. I want in these weeks, in these days, I want to be slowed down. I want to, I want to be tapped in. I want to be cleansed by God. I'm sick and tired of the normal. I want to see something supernatural in my life. I want heaven to come. If that's you I'm describing, could you just raise up a hand? Just let God know. God, I'm in. I want times of refreshment from your Holy Spirit to come. I want to set myself apart, believing I'm going to see wonders worked. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Pour out your spirit. Bless us in these days as we seek you together as a church. You can put your hands down. I want to give an invitation now for anybody who's here. And you, know, you would say, I've never really given my life to Jesus, I think. I mean, I thought I did, but it was more like pouring water on a couch. My hands might be clean, but my heart's not. Jesus wants to come into your life. And I believe God brought you to this moment, to this awareness, to this revelation, to the thick sensation of God being right there with you so he could touch you. And I would just caution you not to put this off, not to say, oh, I'll get right with God later. I have a whole year ahead of me. I want to get through college, or maybe when I'm older, I've had some fun. I mean, doesn't James Garfield's death tell you how, how quickly the end can come? How much life is a vapor? Why not now? Why not here? Why not this moment? Respond to God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I would love to lead you in a prayer. It'd be a privilege. It'd be an honor. As you give your heart to Jesus, responding to the Holy Spirit, not by what you've done, but God's mercy, he'll wash you. Let him wash your hands. Pray this with me out loud, mean it in your heart. Dear God, come into my life. Make me new. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, I pray.